boy, I'll tell you what. I just want to go to space every time I see that space shuttle take off. I don't know if you feel that way. Let me tell you how it feels like inside that thing. You're lying on your back. You get that final countdown, 10, 9, 8. You know, whoever, whoever invented that, you had to shoot the guy. Because the drama's doing just fine without the command countdown. <laughs> Three, two, one, boom, huge explosion, thunder through you. You go up, you immediately go inverted. You're flying upside down. 2,000 switches are going like this. It's like a marble inside a tin can that somebody was just shaking. Violent, chaotic, you're being thrown around. Two minutes later, boom, boom, big explosion. Solid rocket boosters separate, literally explode off, and now the ride goes from utter chaos to pure acceleration, and it feels like you're in a dragster, you get thrown back in your seat, you continue to accelerate, it feels like you, sir, jump on my chest, now pulling two Gs in this direction, you then jump on his chest, now pulling three Gs, sustain that for about the last two and a half minutes of power flight, goal is to get up to 18,000 miles an hour, Mach 25, an engine cut off, and right then the engines cut off and the bodies fly away and as you become weightless your own body sort of flies away and it is uh, 3G crush, release, float, overhead window, peninsula of Florida, the hook of Cape Cod, all you people in Chapel Hill right underneath us, you know, Yahoo, you're in space. <laughs> yeah. And you step back you step back and you've got this grand view of the world. You know, one planet, one incredibly complex ecosystem down below you, one people on the planet, and I just wish I could snap my fingers and get our entire world up in space and realize we're all in it together down there on planet Earth. You talk about perspective shift, you can't help but have that. Our goal now is go catch a Russian space station. I'm gonna live the next five months myself with two Russian cosmonauts. So we crank it up, day and a half later, right underneath it. Mike Baker's flying the shuttle, push pull to control the motion. Perfect docking. You got a picture of this one. We're going 18,000 miles an hour, as is the space station. It's gonna be a manual docking. The tolerance on the docking rings has to be within one inch of tolerance. Closure rate within a tolerance of 0.1 foot per second. You go up too fast. You got a collision, go up too slow, you just sort of bounce off. Mike brings it up. Greatest flying machine ever built by mankind, uh, United States Space Shuttle. Perfect docking, equalize the pressure, fly on board. Technology all coming together to make that moment happen. It's incredible what human beings can do. And I'll tell you, I was up there on that space station. I worked very hard for five months. I'll tell you a few of the stories that happened up there. Some really close calls, 120 experiments. But now and then, I'd levitate over a window and I would just watch the majesty of the Earth for 90 minutes as the sun rose and the sun set and the stars came out and hale Bob Comet would greet me just shining like a flashlight. And I'd have a moment where I'd sort of pinch myself and I would say, Jerry, this is incredible. You're in space. Who would have ever thought of this? You, Jerry Lineger, are sitting, orbiting the world. And we mentioned in the video, does it make you feel bigger, like you're looking down at creation? Or you look out into the universe and you feel like a speck? Does it make you feel smaller? And I had a different perspective change, and I call it a temporal perspective change. I thought about how did the technology ever get here, and how did I, as a human being, ever get here to converge at this moment? And I think about the Wright brothers not too far from here going up, coming down, World War II accelerating our technology, jet engines being developed, rocket scientists coming over from Germany. And with all that technology, it took something else to make it happen, and it took a president that said, we choose to go to the moon. And he said that, and people in the audience down in Houston looked at him and said, what did he just say? And he said, we choose to go to the moon. And he didn't stutter. He said it twice because people could not believe it. And do other things in this decade. Not because they're easy, but because they're hard. <laughs> yeah. And I know we're down south, but if you don't understand Boston talk, it was that we do it because it is hard. It is hard. And then he went on to say, by doing so, we're going to bring out the best in us.
we're going to challenge ourselves. And then he went on and said, it is a race, because we're in a space race at that point. It is a race that we intend to win. No equivocation, no hedging his bet, no doing like politics like we do today. It's we're going to the moon. We're going to get there in 10 years with a background of rockets going up and blowing up and getting one volunteer to go like this and go about 60 miles. That's how much progress we made. And we're going to do it in the next decade. And we're going to win this race. And that vision, along with the technology, is what got me into space. The other thing I kind of reflected on my own personal history, and you might do this as you're listening, think of your own personal history, and I won't give you the whole thing, but I got grandparents from the old country, Slovenia, got on a ship, came over, had some relatives, actually the father died in a, a, a sawmill accident, tetanus in those days, 21 years old, daughter gets shipped off to some relatives in Chicago, my grandpa is a shoemaker over there. He puts all his money together, hops on a ship, gets to New York, and literally sees a train and runs and dives into the boxcar because he's headed to Chicago where he knew some people. He had to get to that train just at the right time because then eventually he meets my grandma, eventually has my mom. I go to the other side of my family. My dad had to survive World War II. His best friend, Jerry. His best friend, Jerry, did not survive. World War II, that's my namesake. He got through that, met my mom, had five kids. And I'm sitting there floating above the planet in space because of that convergence of two temporal changes that took place, the technology and my own existence. And if you've been following along like I asked you to, think of how incredibly against all odds you all are as human beings sitting here on the planet in 2014. And you can go back even further than that in your own families or go back to the time of Christ. And if we were running models at that time, the predictive models would say, sir, your chance of existing today is zero. <laughs> How precious you are. What are you doing with that opportunity? What are you doing with that legacy that's before you? You just putting in time or you making every day count. We do catch up to that space station, open the hatch. I greet my two Russian cosmonaut friends, shuttle departs, and I'm looking at the faces of two Russian cosmonauts for the next five months. One of them was a military engineer, speaks no English, good guy. The other guy, Vasily Sableyev, he also speaks no English. Uh, he used to be a MiG fighter pilot, stationed over in East Germany, opposing our NATO forces in West Germany. You know, I used to fly off the aircraft carrier back to even F-14, escorting Russian bear bombers away from the aircraft carrier task force with radar locked down and missiles ready to fire. You know, different background, different culture, different language, Cold War enemies, five months, pressure cooker environment, or to go on a Saturday night and stuck with each other. And I'll tell you, we got along like human beings can get along. Step back, look at the bigger picture. I thought they, they were thinking the same terms I was thinking. We're up here colonizing space for mankind, and we're going to put all those petty differences aside and get along like human beings can get along and get this mission accomplished. Perspective change. I'm up there, grab some dehydrated, bor dehydrated borscht, suck that down, turn the corner, don't buy that on Franklin Street if you're selling it, trust me. I turn the corner, go into a, look at the, um, put some uh, experimental results up on a laptop computer, so I'm up on the ceiling just entering the data results, and I hear blang, 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 master alarm going off again. You know, a master alarm means you're having a bad day in space. Uh, I've been hearing master alarms two or three a day. Space station's 13 years old, designed life for three to five years. One day it's the uh, oxygen generator, you either fix it or you're gonna suffocate in about a day and a half. Another day it's a computer, integrates star sensor data, turns these big gyroscopic devices, lines the solar panels up, and when that thing fails, instead of getting lined up with the sun, you move to the dark side of the earth, come around that limb of the earth, and without getting lined up, you start doing this and tumbling through space. And if you're inside that spacecraft right now, you see the walls and the ceiling doing this around you, very disconcerting. Uh, quickly able to fix that problem. This particular time, though, it's still blaring. I look around, walls aren't tumbling. I think, ah, it's probably just the carbon dioxide scrubber. 
hit the enter button to save the data, push off, go to turn the corner to look at the caution warning panel. But before I get there, Vasily comes flying fast around the corner, and I yell out, Seriosni, and he says, Da Ochen Bajar. I asked, is it serious? He said, yes, very, fire. Uh, I really didn't have to answer me, because before he could answer me, I saw smoke billowing out of that module. And I've done Navy firefighting before. Flames is big around me. I've never seen smoke spread like it spread on that space station. Couldn't see the five fingers in front of your face. Uh, continued forward, looked uh, again, caution warning panel, then made my way to try to get a respirator, feeling my way along the bulkhead, starting to feel as if I had swum maybe 50 meters underwater, starting to get a little fuzzy peripheral vision from needing oxygen. I finally uh, locate that respirator, yank it off the wall, full rubber mask over my head, I activate the oxygen generator breathe in, and I get nothing. I check the lever, it's set correctly, I breathe in again, mask just collapses around my face, got a failed respirator, yank that off my head. I'll tell you, next 60 seconds of my life, frame by flame, split, uh, split second by split second inside my head. You know, feeling way along that bulkhead, trying to locate a second respirator, a lot of thoughts racing through my head. First thought was in my son, and I yelled it out, I said, goodbye, John. It's only a year and a half years old. Really sorry I'm letting you down. Looks like I won't be making it back. And I'll be watching over you, John. Uh, next thought was my wife. Again, yelled it out, I said, goodbye, Catherine. Uh, really sorry I'm letting you down. Take care, John. Take care of the baby to be. My wife's actually pregnant this time. Uh, love you a lot, dear. Next thing was a really bad pain of regret. It was okay I was leaving this world, sort of accepted that, but I had a really bad pain of regret when I realized I left nothing behind for my boy. You know, he's only a year and a half years old, but I told myself, you know, Jerry, you could have written him something, told him why you're up here, what you believe in, what you hope for him in his life. You know, if nothing else, little note, dear John, love you, Dad. You know, bad pain of regret left nothing behind. At this point, I am really needing an option. The world's sort of closing in on me. I finally find that respirator, yank it off the wall, full rubber mask over my head. I activate and say, God help me, breathe in, and I get oxygen. I hyperventilate for the next 30 seconds or so, get my blood level back up, and then I scream out, we're gonna get that fire out, I'm gonna see my boy again, I'm gonna do everything right. I won't get into all the things with the fire, but we eventually got the fire out about 14 minutes, went through three different fire extinguishers. It's like a blowtorch burning. Lucky it didn't point down because that would have violated the hull, and then you've got a rapid decompression, quick suffocation. Uh, but we eventually got it over with. I learned a lot from that experience, though. I learned human beings can rise to the occasion when you have a passion for something, when something really means something to you. I also learned what's important in life. When I'm thinking I'm taking my last breath, what's important is the people that I'm leaving behind, the relationships I have. You know, after five months in space, doing spacewalks, everything else, it's time to come home. I am uh, get a call from Mission Control Moscow. Shuttle came back to pick me up, so we're talking English again, eating shrimp cocktail even, dehydrated, but not bad. Um, <laughs> And I'll call back, they say, put this in your computer, 47.621 seconds. We put it in the computer, read it back, they say, that's correct. We take the shuttle, start flying upside down and backwards, and we're inverted. And we get the call that you go for the deorbit burn. We're off the coast of India, middle of the Indian Ocean, and we fire the engines for 47.621 seconds. And our objective is to glide down and hit not only planet Earth, and not only the peninsula of Florida, but to hit the approach end or runway at the Kennedy Space Center on altitude of precisely 220 knots. You know, it boggles the mind to think that human beings can figure this stuff out. <laughs> There's about three people, four people, Mission Control Houston, that figure it out. And after every mission, I go up to them and I say, Karen, thank you very much for getting me back. You know, George, I don't know how you get to it. And I say, you know, how do you do it? And they say, well, we've got the right computer system behind us, good training. Of course, around the backs of all the legacy of all those people that sacrificed, in many cases, their lives to make this happen. Run the computer systems, check it, double check it, triple check it. And then they usually say, hey, Jerry, it's good to see you also, as if they're not really sure about that calculation. <laughs> Incredible the power of human beings, melding brain power together, nothing you can't accomplish. 
That's what TED's all about. Melding brain power together, common purpose, common goal. Step back, look at the big picture, nothing you can't accomplish. I'm used to countdown clocks, and I already counted down, so I just gotta tell you, when I finally land in that space shuttle, and they open that side hatch, and the fresh air comes gushing in, ah, earth air. You know, it's all around you, you don't have to make it. You don't have to worry about it rushing out, rapid decompression suffocating you. Just tastes good. You know, is there anyone in this room that's even paid a iota of thought about the breath of air that you've taken today? You know, anyone? I try to get up every morning, take a deep breath, count my blessings. <coughs> If you're having a bad day, just take a deep breath, say, man, what a great life we have. What a great existence here on the planet. You should be smiling every second of your life. Final thing, I finally got to go see my wife. She's at the end of a long, sterile-looking corridor. She's holding John. John's a year and a half years old, now got a lot bigger. She hands me John. Of course, I'm used to everything floating. He's feeling really heavy. <laughs> I tell my wife, I better stay close, because I might forget and set him out there. <laughs> I can see the headline, you know, astronaut drops sun on head first day back. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the last thing I'll leave you with is this. People say, how do you top going off into space? And I'll tell you, it's tough to top. But the way you top it is with the people you care about, the relationships you have in your life. That's what makes us human. And being back on Earth with my beautiful wife, and my son, and my son-to-be, you know, that's what makes us human. That's what so I urge you all to change your perspective now and then. When you see a conflict, step back, try to figure it out. If you don't get it, step back a little bit further. Realize how precious each person here is on the planet and how blessed we are to be here and make something of your life and the great opportunities that you have. And always remember that relationships are what make us human, meld the brain power together, do hard things, and come back to TED next year and look each other in the eyes and say, man, that was a good year. Lived a life with some honor, some dignity. Moved myself forward, my organization forward, company forward, whatever it might be. You know, have some pride in what you're doing. Absolute honor representing you all, my United States Navy and Marine Corps, all the citizens of the United States of America, and the way I looked at it, people of planet Earth. And I try to represent you well out there in space, moving mankind forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>